John Keats, romantic poet of the senses. None of the second generation of male romantic poets lived very long. Uh, Byron made it to 36, Shelley died at 29, but Keats was the youngest of the major romantic poets, and he was the first to die. He died of tuberculosis in 1821 at the age of 25. But by the time of his death, he had written some of the most beautiful and moving poetry in the English language. Keats's biography is relevant to his poetry and its reception. He came from a lower social class than his fellow romantics, except maybe Blake, and he received an inferior education. His father was a livery stable keeper, and he died when Keats was eight. His mother died when he was 14. Keats did not attend university. Uh, he was apprenticed to an apothecary surgeon at age 15. Now, even though an apothecary surgeon is in the medical field, it was he, he was not a professional man. It was one step up from a shopkeeper. Um, he left this profession. He never actually practiced as an apothecary uh, in order to focus on writing poetry. But his medical training didn't go to waste because it may help to account for the extraordinary physical and sensory imagery in his poems. I could illustrate um, the beauty of his poetic imagery and the sound of his poems with any of the works you were assigned this week, but the most challenging poem we read is The Eve of St. Agnes, so that's the one I plan to discuss in this video. St. Agnes was a virgin martyr of the fourth century, and she was the patron saint of virgins. Her feast day is January 21st, so the eve of St. Agnes will be the evening of January 20th. The superstition was that um, on the night before St. Agnes Day, if a young virgin skipped supper, lay down on her bed, bed naked, uh, on her back, looking up to the heavens, her future husband would appear to her in a dream, kiss her, and feast with her. Um, that's the basis for the poem that Keats writes. Here are the opening stanzas. St. Agnes' Eve, a bitter chill it was. The owl, for all his feathers, was a cold. The hare limped trembling through the frozen grass, and silent was the flock in woolly fold. Numb with the beadsman's fingers while he told his rosary, and while his frosted breath, like pious incense from a censer old, seemed taking flight for heaven without a death, past the sweet virgin's picture, while his prayer he saith. His prayer he saith, this patient holy man, then takes his lamp and riseth from his knees, and back returneth, meager, barefoot, wan, Along the chapel aisle by slow degrees, the sculpture dead on each side seemed to freeze, imprisoned in black purgatorial rails, knights, ladies, praying in dumb oratories. He passes by, and his weak spirit fails to think how they may ache in icy hoods and nails. Okay, this is the frame narrative. Um, this talk about the beadsman opens the poem and ends the poem. I want you to feel the imagery here, especially the physical sensation of cold. Bitter chill it was. And notice the assonance, bitter chill it, right? The short I sounds. The owl is cold, the rabbit is trembling, the beadsman's hands are numb. And you can see his breath. His breath is rising like incense. Even the effigies on the tombs in that second stanza seem cold, freezing, even, last line, aching with the cold. Keats makes you feel it. Immediately, though, after this uh, initial frame narrative, this description, Keats turns to a description of a grand ball going on inside the mansion, uh, a real contrast to this kind of cold, black-and-white picture. 
that's where the young maiden Madeline waits impatiently to carry out the rites of St. Agnes and dream of her future husband. Meanwhile, Porphyro sneaks into the mansion. There's a Romeo and Juliet situation here. Porphyro and Madeline are in love, but their families hate each other. It's clear that Porphyro is risking his life to come and try to see Madeline. The only person who doesn't oppose their love is Madeline's um, woman servant, right? Her old serving woman who hides Porphyro and tells him what Madeline is planning to do. Now, when he hears that, he suddenly has an idea. Sudden a thought came like a full-blown rose, flushing his brow, and in his pained heart made purple riot. Then doth he propose a stratagem that makes the beldame start. A cruel man and impious thou art, sweet lady, let her pray and sleep and dream alone with her good angels, far apart from wicked men like thee. Go, go, I deem thou canst not surely be the same that thou didst seem. Right? Um, note the physical reaction, the physicality of his reaction to the idea. Right? His brow flushes, and in his pained heart made purple riot. Um, you've also got great sound effects, right? Alliteration, pained and purple, and uh, consonants. Heart and riot in his pained heart made purple riot. Um, he's really excited about this idea. He's going to sneak into her room, hide until she falls asleep, and then become the dream husband, preparing her a rich and exotic feast. And he convinces the serving woman to help him. Hiding. Porphyro watches as she says her prayers. Uh, and note Keats's beautiful description how the moonlight coming through the stained glass window creates patterns of color over Madeline's body and clothes. Full on this casement shone the wintry moon and threw warm gules on Madeline's fair breast as down she knelt for heaven's grace and boon. Rose bloom fell on her hands, together pressed, and on her silver cross soft amethyst, and on her hair a glory like a saint, she seemed a splendid angel newly dressed, save wings for heaven. Porphyro grew faint, she knelt so pure a thing, so free from mortal taint. Anon his heart revives, her vespers done, of all its wreathed pearls her hair she frees, unclasps her warmed jewels one by one, loosens her fragrant bodice. By degrees her rich attire creeps rustling to her knees, half hidden like a mermaid in seaweed. Pensive a while she dreams awake and sees in fancy fair St. Agnes in her bed, but dares not look behind, or all the charm is fled. So the first stanza, she's very pure, and you see these beautiful stained glass colors falling on her, uh, her hands together pressed. Her silver cross turns purple. She seems to have a halo, a glory, like a saint. But in the second, okay, she undresses, getting ready for bed. And Keats doesn't describe just her appearance, just what um, Porphyro is able to see, he involves almost all the senses in the experience. You can smell her fragrant bodice. You hear the rustle as her dress falls from her body. And my very favorite detail, her jewels are actually warmed by her body. It's a really sensuous description. So Porphyro waits for her to get into bed and fall asleep. And then he brings out a feast of exotic foods, which Keats also describes in sensuous detail, not just evoking the tastes, but also the scents and the textures of the food. I'll let you go back and read that again. Um, it's really beautiful. When everything's ready, he goes to her, leans on the bed on the pillow next to her, and wakes her to the playing of his flute. 
but when she wakes, she's distressed. Her eyes were open, but she still beheld, now wide awake, the vision of her sleep. There was a painful change that nigh expelled the blisses of her dream so pure and deep, at which fair Madeline began to weep and moan forth witless words with many a sigh, while still her gaze on Porphyro would keep, who knelt with joined hands and piteous eye, fearing to move or speak, she looked so dreamingly. Ah, Porphyro, said she, but even now thy voice was at sweet tremble in mine ear, made tunable with every sweetest vow, and those sad eyes were spiritual and clear. How changed thou art, how pallid, chill, and drear. Give me that voice again, my poor Pharaoh, those looks immortal, those complainings dear. And leave me not in this eternal woe, for if thou diest, my love, I know not where to go. She had been dreaming of him, her future husband, and when he wakes her up, there he is, right? She still sees him. But the real-life Porphyro isn't as perfect as the dream Porphyro. The dream lover is immortal. But Porphyro is obviously mortal, pallid, chill, and drear. And she even fears that he will die. The dream is better than the physical reality. And here it is, the climax of the poem. Beyond a mortal man impassioned far at these voluptuous accents, he rose ethereal, flushed, and like a throbbing star seen mid the sapphire heaven's deep repose. Into her dream he melted, as the rose blendeth its odor with a violet, solution sweet. Meantime the frost wind blows, like love's alarm pattering the sharp sleet against the window panes. St. Agnes Moon half set. Okay, so some critics pretend not to know what happens here. Um, and it's true, the consummation of their love is expressed through imagery. But for me, I still think it's clear what happens. Um, he's flushed and like a throbbing star. Um, they join together into her dream he melted uh, as the, the scent of a rose and the scent of violet solution. Sweet. Um, apparently, actually, Keats wrote a more explicit version, which his publisher refused to print, which made it perfectly clear um, that this was the consummation of their love. Madeline's response also makes sense, only if you assume that they had sex. Tis dark, quick pattereth the flaw-blown sleet. This is no dream, my bride, my Madeline. Tis dark. The iced gusts still rave and beat. No dream. Alas, alas, and woe is mine. Porphyro will leave me here to fade and pine. Cruel, what traitor could thee hither bring? I curse not, for my heart is lost in thine. Though thou forsakest a deceived thing, A dove forlorn and lost, With sick, unpruned wing. The Porphyro, reassures her that he loves her, and he means for them to run away together. And they do, through the mansion, past the party guests who are sleeping off their evening's revels, and finally back outside. Just as the start of the poem began outside, then moved into the mansion and the public rooms, and finally into that sanctuary of Madeline's bedroom, so the end of the poem starts at the center and moves outward. And the frame narrative concludes with the beadsman, oh, celibate, ascetic, freezing cold, um, which forms a final contrast with the sensuous warmth of the fleeing lovers. And they are gone. Aye, ages long ago, these lovers fled away into the storm. That night the baron dreamt of many a woe, and all his warrior guests, with shade and form of witch and demon and large coffin worm, were long benightmared. Angela, the old, died palsy-twitched, with meagre face deformed. The beadsman, after thousand aves told, for I unsought for, slept among his ashes cold. 